armamentarium for this procedure includes rubber dam, floss, high and low speed hand pieces, a number 330 burr, a number 4 round burr, titrator, amalgam carrier, amalgam well, amalgam condenser, the cleoid discoid, a ball burnisher, a cotton pellet or swab, cotton pliers, and articulating paper. General considerations for this procedure include the outline form should include all retentive and or carious fissures, but should be as conservative as possible. Ideal pulpal floor depth is 0.5 millimeters into dentin, or approximately 1.5 millimeters from the enamel surface. The length of the cutting end of the number 330 burr is 1.5 millimeters, so this becomes a good tool for gauging preparation depth. The cable surface margin should be placed out of a stress bearing areas and should not have a bevel. The outline form should be composed of smoothly flowing arcs and curves, and all internal angles should be sharp. When a dovetail is placed in the second primary molars, its buccolingual width should be greater than the width of the isthmus. This produces a locking form, providing resistance against occlusal torque, which may displace the restoration mesially or distally. The isthmus should be one-third of the intercuspal width, and the buccolingual walls should converge slightly in an occlusal direction. The mesial and distal walls should flare at the marginal ridges to not undercut the ridges. Oblique ridges should not be crossed unless they are undermined with caries or are deeply fissured. Placement of bases and primary teeth is uncommon, but when necessary, use of a glass ionomer or resin modified glass ionomer material is recommended. Because of the relatively large size of the pulp chamber and primary teeth, preparations that are placed deep enough to require bases could potentially result in pulpal exposure and thence require other treatment. Morphological considerations include the characteristic sharp lingual inclination occlusal to the facial surfaces results in the formation of a distinct facial gingival ridge that ends abruptly at the CEJ. The buccal and lingual surfaces of the molars, which converge occlusally, form a narrow occlusal surface or food table. This is especially true of the first primary molar. The pulpal outline of primary teeth follows the DEJ more closely than that of permanent teeth. The pulpal horns are longer and more pointed than cusps would indicate. The dentin has less bulk or thickness, so the pulp is proportionally larger than that of permanent teeth. The enamel of the primary teeth is thin, but of uniform thickness. The enamel surface tends to be parallel to the DEJ. Place the rubber dam. Using a number 330 burr in the high sweet handpiece, penetrate into the tooth parallel to its long axis in the central pit region and extend into all susceptible fissures and pits to a depth of 0.5 millimeters into dentin, 1.5 millimeters to 2 millimeters. Smooth the enamel walls and refine the final outline form with the number 330 burr. Remove all carious dentin by using a number 4 round burr in the slow speed handpiece or a sharp spoon excavator. Rinse and dry the preparation and complete a final inspection for any remaining caries, sharp cable surface margins, and unsupported enamel. Triturate the amalgam and place one carrier load of amalgam into the preparation. Using a small condenser, immediately begin condensation of the amalgam into the preparation. Use small overlapping increments with firm pressure until the cavity is slightly overfilled. Following condensation, use a ball burnisher to begin initial contouring by pushing the excess amalgam up and away from the margins. Use a small cleoid discoid for carving primary restorations. Always keep part of the carving edge of the instrument on the tooth structure to remove flash and maintain marginal integrity. Keep anatomy and primary molars shallow to avoid weakening the restoration, creating a thin shelf of amalgam at the cable surface margin and reducing the bulk of amalgam in the central stress bearing areas can both lead to fracture. When the amalgam has begun its initial set and resists deformation, begin to burnish the amalgam. 
This is done with a small round burnisher, which is lightly rubbed across the carved amalgam surface to produce a satin-like appearance. Besides smoothing, burnishing creates a substructure with fewer voids. A smooth finish can be obtained by using a wet cotton pellet Remove the rubber dam and check occlusion. Children must be cautioned before the rubber dam is completely removed to not close their teeth into occlusion until instructed to do so. With articulating paper, check the restoration for occlusal irregularities. Make necessary adjustments. The goals of this preparation include a smooth and flowing outline, optimal treatment of fissures, an isthmus that is one-third the intercuspal width, pulpal and axial floor depths are appropriate, internal walls are smooth and well-defined, and line angles are sharp. The goals for the restoration include anatomy that is consistent and harmonious with tooth structure, the absence of flash, a restoration that is smooth without pits, voids, or irregularities, proper occlusion, and no soft tissue damage. Common errors include preparing the cavity too deep, undercutting the marginal ridges, carving the anatomy of the amalgam too deep, not removing amalgam flash from cavosurface margins, undercarving which leads to subsequent fracture of amalgam from hyperocclusion, and not including all susceptible fissures.